112 years ago today, a monumental event occurred that would forever change world history and would feature in cultural endeavors of art, music, literature, film, and dance during the century plus that followed. This disaster, more than others before or since, has seemed to capture public interest and also sparked growth in the salvage industry. Why could this be? Is it from society's fascination with the lifestyles of the affluent passengers on board? Or the treasures they brought with them? Perhaps it is because of the grandiose, boastful declaration that this ship is unsinkable. Well, guess what? It sank. So what happened? Let's take a look at the timeline, events, and some things that might have had hand in this tragedy. The Titanic was the second of three Olympic-class ocean liners and was the largest ship in the world at that time. It could carry 3,547 people on its 10 decks. First-class accommodations were luxuriously expensive. The cost of a one-way ticket for a parlor suite with a private promenade was $4,350, which is equivalent to about $132,000 today. Even third class was much fancier than the typical third class of the time, with the food and quarters reportedly being better than some experienced at home. 62-year-old Edward Smith was chosen as captain for this voyage, which was ideal because he was the most senior of all the White Star Line's captains. The bad luck all started on April 1st, 1912. One of the Titanic's coal bins caught fire. Now this fire would actually continue burning into the first few days of the ship's inaugural voyage. Titanic left the Southampton dock on April 10, 1912, shortly after 12 noon. Their destination was New York. There were 2,224 people total on board. There was 1,332 of those were passengers and 892 were crew. The crew was mostly firemen, engineers, and stokers. Only 45 of the crew were seaworthy personnel. Unfortunately, most of them had just joined in the departure city of Southampton, so hadn't really had much time to familiarize themselves with the ship. There was more drama as they left. Titanic's huge size caused two nearby ships to be lifted as a result of water displacement and then fall back down, which snapped the mooring cables of one of the ships, the New York. Titanic barely missed collision with that ship by just four feet. By April 14, 1912, Titanic entered the area of the Atlantic known as Iceberg Alley along the coast of Newfoundland. The recent mild winter had resulted in the worst ice activity in 50 years. There was an abundance of icebergs that had broken off the west coast of Greenland, but the weather was clear and seas were calm. This clear, calm weather combined with a moonless night, though, meant that spotting ice would be monumentally difficult. To further complicate matters, the lookouts on the Titanic did not have any binoculars because of a mix-up in Southampton. Throughout the day on the 14th, the Titanic was sent ice warnings from six other ships. The first warning came at 0900 from RMS Coronia. Captain Smith acknowledged receipt of this message. The second warning at 1342 from RMS Baltic was actually relaying a report that they had received from the Greek ship Athenia. Captain Smith on the Titanic also acknowledged this report and actually had the ship change direction a little to move a little bit more south. The third warning at 1345 was from the German ship SS America, a little south of Titanic. This message never reached Captain Smith or the other officers on the bridge. The fourth warning from SS Californian reported three large bergs at 1930. At 2140, a fifth warning came from the steamer Misaba. This message too never left the Titanic's radio room because the radio reporter, Jack Phillips, was busy transmitting a backlog of passenger messages to the Cape Race relay station, so did not deem it as important. 
The sixth final warning was received at 22.30 from the SS Californian again, reporting that they had stopped for the night in an ice field many miles away. Titanic's operator Phillips cut off the message and signaled back, Shut up! Shut up! I'm working Cape Race! Despite all these warnings and the crew's awareness of potential dangerous ice, Titanic continued course, steaming at almost full maximum speed, 22 knots out of 24 knots. At that time, that was standard maritime practice for cruise ships. The North Atlantic cruise ships tended to prioritize timekeeping above everything else. They always stuck to a schedule that would guarantee their arrival at the advertised time. Most of the time, that meant they operated at close to their full speed, treating hazard warnings as more as like advisories rather than actually doing anything about them. So on April 14, 1912, at 23.30, it was bedtime for the SS Californian, and they shut down the radio set for the night. In the minutes between 23.30 and 23.36, Titanic lookouts Fleet and Lee in the crow's nest noticed a slight haze on the horizon ahead, but did not make anything out of it. The port list was at 2.5 degrees, head trim was at zero. So we'll pause for just a second here just to say what those mean to establish and explain some nautical stats. The list is the degree of lean, left or right. Left is port or port side. Right is starboard or the starboard side. The bow or forward is the front of the ship. The stern or the aft is the back of the ship. Head trim means the bow weight, um, basically how much the center of gravity shifts forward, or in this case down, like into the water. So right now the list, or lean, is 2.5 degrees port left, and it is level at zero, so the head trim is zero. At 23.39, Fleet spotted an iceberg in Titanic's path. He rang the lookout bell three times, and telephoned the bridge to inform 6th Officer James Moody. Fleet said, is there anyone there? Moody replied, yes, what do you see? Fleet, iceberg right ahead. Moody relayed the message to 1st Officer William Murdoch, who ordered the quartermaster to change the ship's course. Murdoch apparently ordered hard a starboard, which means to move the ship's tiller all the way to starboard to try to turn the ship to port. He also rang full astern on the ship's telegraphs, which means reverse. There is also evidence that Murdoch only signaled the engine room to stop, but not reverse. Lead fireman Frederick Barrett testified that the stoplight came on, but that the order wasn't executed before the collision with the iceberg. What they were trying to do was to first swing the bow around the obstacle, then swing the stern so that both ends of the ship would avoid a collision with the iceberg. It was a steam-powered steering mechanism, so it took up to 30 seconds to respond to turn the ship's tiller. So at 2340, even though Titanic's heading changed just in time to avoid a head-on collision, that change in direction caused the ship to strike the iceberg with just a glancing blow. Underwater ice scraped along the starboard side of the ship for about seven seconds, and chunks of ice from the top of the berg fell onto the forward decks of the Titanic. Port list is now 2.0 degrees, head trim is still level at zero. As we mentioned in the intro, no one thought the Titanic was going to go under. When they first hit, they apparently joked that they had to stop for a fresh coat of paint to be applied where the iceberg scraped the hull. After all, the Titanic was unsinkable. The ship was designed to remain afloat with up to four of the forward compartments flooded. Post-evaluation of this disaster revealed that 16 compartments were flooded by this collision. It was debated whether the hole was a single puncture, approximately 12 square feet, or whether it was a bunch of narrower bricks. Modern ultrasound scans of the wreck lean more towards the multi-rip theory, and also further indicate it might have also had something to do with the iron rivets on the hull plates. The hull plate rivets weren't high quality steel rivets like in the central hull, but were instead wrought iron rivets that had a tendency to be more brittle, especially in extreme cold. 
like an iceberg field? The hull plates themselves have also come into question. Hull plates seem to have just shattered upon impact instead of just bending. The ship began to flood immediately with water pouring in 15 times faster than it could be pumped out. The ship was set up into 16 sections bow to stern with each section walled bottom upwards by watertight bulkheads like dividers. Unfortunately, these bulkheads were not closed off at the top. What this means is that as more water entered into a compartment, water would then spill into other compartments, kind of like you see in an ice cube tray. At 2341, the port list is now 1.0, head trim is zero. Above the waterline, there wasn't much evidence of the collision, so it wasn't really taken very seriously. Crew that were having a break just below the fore deck rushed up to see ice and snow on deck, but brushed it off as standard and returned below, complaining that their break had been interrupted. The stewards in the first class dining room did notice a shutter, but they thought maybe it was just minor damage to a propeller blade. At this time, crew members started inspecting the ship for damage to see what the damage was. At 2342, port list goes to zero, head trim is still zero. Within a few seconds, list to starboard now, 1.0. Then a few seconds after that, we have a starboard list of 2.0. Within a minute, now we have a starboard list of 3.0 and then 4.0 pretty much instantly. 2345, now it's listing starboard 5.0. The peak tank below the water surface level at the bow is quickly flooding. 2346, the boilers were full of hot, high pressure steam, and there was a huge danger of explosion if they came into contact with the ice cold seawater. The stokers and firemen were ordered to reduce the fires and vent the boilers, which sent huge amounts of steam up the venting pipes and the funnels. Why does this matter? Well now, the steam blasting up the pipes and funnels was definitely loud for pretty much the remainder of the tragedy. 2350, water began to enter in the mail room. The mail sorters tried in vain to save the 400,000 items of mail that were being carried aboard the Titanic. A couple minutes after, the lights extinguished in the boiler rooms, so Fireman Barrett is ordered to get lamps for boiler room 5. Flooding from below reaches the G deck, which is the 8th deck down from the top, so in just 12 minutes we're at 20% flooding. 2353, cargo hold 1 is now flooding, which is the 7th level down. A few minutes after that, the mail room is flooded. Between 2359 and 0005 on the 15th of April, Captain Smith ordered the ship's lifeboats to start to be uncovered. At zero hours, starboard list is still 5.0, but the head trim is now at 1.0. One minute later, the starboard list reduces to 4.0, head trim is still 1.0. Minute after that, so we've got two minutes after midnight now, crew on the C deck receive reports that crew quarters on the F deck, the sixth level down, were beginning to flood. At 005, Captain Smith orders to have the passengers mustered, meaning gathered for departure. Now, the Titanic didn't have a public address system, so the stewards basically had to go door to door, waking up passengers and crew to tell them to go to the boat dock. Some of them were even told the journey would resume soon. These actions were very disproportionate since the first class stewards were in charge of only a few cabins, but those responsible for the second and third class passengers had to manage huge numbers of people. So the first class stewards provided hands-on assistance, helping their charges to get dressed, bringing them out into the deck with their life belts and blankets and towels, but the second and third class stewards mostly just had to throw open doors, yelling at passengers to put on life belts and go up to the boat deck. Um, in the third class, passengers are pretty much left to fend for themselves. Every man for himself. Um, at 0007, second officer Charles Lightoller went to the port forward deck and noticed that none of the lifeboats have even started to be uncovered yet. Ten minutes after midnight, flooding water now reaches the E deck, meaning the bottom three levels have flooded. 
At 0011, the band decides to play tunes to cheer up passengers, so they start walking to the upper decks where they intend to start playing. At 0015, Captain Smith orders the crew in the Marconi wireless room to make preparations to send out a call for assistance, but don't send any messages yet, just get ready to. Starboard list is 4.0, head trim is now 2.0. The crew have to use hand signals while preparing the life rafts because of the deafening noise of that steam coming through the funnels. Some passengers are not taking the situation seriously. There's a few of them playing a football game with some of the ice chunks. Some of the passengers are even using gymnasium equipment. Chief Baker, Charles Jokin, takes it seriously though. He gives loaves of bread to men to provide to each of the lifeboats. So he gives them about two loaves per each lifeboat and there are 20 lifeboats. At 0017, the band arrives at the first class entrance and begins to play music to ease the passengers. At 0020, ship designer Thomas Andrews finishes his review of the ship damage and makes his way to the bridge to let Captain Smith know that the ship is definitely going to sink. At 0023, starboard list is now 3.0, head trim is 2.0. A couple minutes after, the starboard list is 2.0, head trim is still 2.0. So within 45 minutes of the collision, at least 13,500 long tons of water had entered the ship. That's equivalent to 13,700 tons. At 0026, Captain returns to the Marconi room to advise the operators to go ahead and send the distress message. At that time, the letters CQD was used in distress calls to mean all stations. So the letters CQ represent the words seek you. They send their first message seen here. At 0027, Officer Boxhall is advised by Captain Smith that the distress signal has been sent. Boxhall worries, based on the information that he got from Captain Smith, that the position might not be correct, so he goes to the chart room to better figure out their true position. There were now several replies to the distress call between 0027 to 0029. Frankfurt messages Titanic, what is the matter? Titanic sends Frankfurt their coordinates. Frankfurt, okay, stand by. Mount Temple messages Titanic, what is the matter? Titanic says, cannot read you, old man, but here's my position, and they give these coordinates, you see. Mount Temple messages Titanic received, will tell Captain. Titanic continues sending the CQD message. At 0029, Cape Race Station sends coordinates to all available stations. At 0030, another ship, the Yapranga, forwards distress message and the location with the note requires assistance, and they repeat that message 10 times. The first group of women and children on the Titanic are escorted to a lifeboat. Flares are fired from the Titanic, and this continues every few minutes for the next while. Over on the SS Californian, 2nd Officer Herbert Stone sees white rockets exploding above the stopped ship, but he wasn't sure what the rockets meant, so he called down to their captain, Captain Lord, and reported the sighting. Captain Lord shrugged it off, which concerned Stone. A ship is not going to fire rockets at sea for nothing, he told a colleague. At 0031, the Yapranga repeats their requires assistance message seven more times. Titanic messages the Asian their coordinates that are different, you can see here. The Asian sends back, Captain wants position repeated, thank you. At 0032, Captain Smith places second officer Lightoller and first officer William Murdoch in charge of putting the women and children into lifeboats. Lightoller was in charge of the port side and Murdoch was in charge of starboard. The two officers interpreted the women and children evacuation order differently. Murdoch took it to mean women and children first, while Lightholder took it to mean women and children only. As a result, Lightholder lowered lifeboats with empty seats if there were no women and children waiting to board, while Murdoch allowed a limited number of men to board only if all the nearby women and children had boarded. Many passengers and crew were reluctant to comply, either refusing to believe that there was a problem or preferring the warmth of the ship's interior to the freezing night air. 
the passengers were also still not told that the ship was actually sinking. At 0035, Boxhall finishes his calculations of the tr ship's true position and is ordered to provide the corrected coordinates to the wireless room for transmission. Starboard list is still 2.0, head trim is now 3.0. Water reaches the E-deck, which is the top of the aforementioned watertight bulkheads. You may remember they're open at the top, which means the water will pour over the top of the bulkhead into the further sections, much like we referenced the ice cube tray. At 0036, the ship Carpathia messages Titanic. Do you know that Cape Cod is sending a batch of messages for you? Titanic sends the new coordinates, come at once, struck a berg. Carpathia replies, shall I tell my captain, do you require assistance? Titanic, yes, come quick. At 0038, Titanic sends another CQD message to update their coordinates with Boxhall's new information you can see here. Cape Race Station forwards the Titanic's updated coordinates to all stations. At 0039, now an hour after the collision, the trim, or down angle, has changed drastically during the first hour, but during the second hour the sinking rate slowed, which gives passengers false hope that they wouldn't sink after all, or at least that they could stay afloat long enough to be rescued from the ship. So as a result, many were even more reluctant now to board the lifeboats, deeming the little boats unsafe as compared to the Titanic. At 0040, the first lifeboat, lifeboat number 7, is lowered less than half full. Two minutes later, Titanic sends another distress call, you can see here, and repeats that two to three times. At 0043, lifeboat number 5 is lowered approximately half full. It dips while being lowered, so crew stop to work on leveling the boat. The women in the boat plead to allow their husbands and sons into the boat. So a few men are allowed, increasing the boat population from 36 to 41, then the lowering resumes. Officer Boxhall looks closer at the light on the horizon he had seen earlier and discovers it is the lights of another ship. Titanic sends a message to the ship, the SS Californian, that they struck a berg and require assistance. An order is given on the Titanic to open all watertight doors behind the engine room to allow transport of a portable suction pipe to boiler room 4. Also at 0045, lifeboat number 7 was rowed away from the Titanic with approximately 28 passengers on board out of a capacity of 65. At 0046, Titanic sends another message trying to reach the SS Californian. 0047, Lytoller, Wild, Smith, and Murdoch get some revolvers from Murdoch's lockbox to enforce security at their respective lifeboat stations because it's getting out of hand. There is now a small flurry of radio communication between many different ships and stations. At 0047, the Coronia sends message to another ship, the Baltic. Stop transmitting. Titanic struck a berg. Requires immediate assistance. Baltic then messages Titanic, are you in need of assistance? Frankfurt messages Titanic, position 39, 47 north, 50, 10 west. Titanic replies to Frankfurt, are you coming to our assistance? Frankfurt says, what's the matter with you? 48, Titanic replies to Frankfurt that they hit an iceberg, they're sinking, and to tell their captain. Frankfurt, okay, we'll tell bridge right away. Titanic, okay, yes, quick. 0049, Carpathia messages Titanic. Old man, we are about 58 miles off. Titanic, all right, old man. 52, Titanic sends a message to unknown. Olympic sends a service message to Titanic. The Carpathia then messages Titanic. Don't you hear Olympic calling you? Titanic says, no, I can't read him for rush of air and noise of the steam. Carpathia says that they're on their way to the Titanic and they expect to arrive in four hours. Titanic, received. Thanks, old man. Frankfurt signals Titanic. Olympic tries calling Titanic again. At 0054, lifeboat number five begins rowing away. Then a minute later, num lifeboat number three is lowered about half full. Lifeboat number six on the port side was the next to be lowered with only 28 people on board. Lytola realized there was only one seaman on board, quartermaster Robert Hitchens, and called for volunteers. 
Major Arthur Godfrey Pukin of the Royal Canadian Yacht Club stepped forward and climbed down a rope into the lifeboat. He was the only adult male passenger whom Lightholder allowed to board during the portside evacuation. Rumor circulates on the ship that men were being allowed to board boats on the port side, likely as a result of the volunteer that was just allowed into boat number six. This resulted in a huge crowd of men now at the aft port side boat deck. At 0056, operators in the Marconi room contemplate using the newly created SOS signal in their messages. So they go ahead and send Olympic a couple of SOS CQD messages. And then they message Californian for assistance again, trying to reach that Californian, the boat on the distance there. The Cape Race Station also messages the Californian for assistance. 0057, on the Titanic, Captain Smith orders that women be taken to the ship that they can see off in the distance, which we know is the SS Californian. At 0100, boat number 8 leaves with 39 people. 101, Titanic calls Coronia and they also send a CQD message out, just in random. Olympic messages Titanic, do you need assistance? Titanic messages the Virginian, struck iceberg, need assistance. 102, the Virginian messages Titanic that they're altering course and about 178 miles off. Then they radio the Cape Ray station to let them know they're going to the Titanic's assistance. 104, lifeboats 3, 6, and 8 row toward those nearby ship lights. Titanic sends an SOS message out with their coordinates that you see here. Olympic messages Titanic. The starboard list is now 1.0, head trim is 